Imagine flying into a remote island in the Caribbean or landing on a tiny runway carved into the side of a mountain in Nepal. Imagine an airplane that can operate dozens of short hops a day, burn almost no fuel, and still make money on routes that would bankrupt a regional jet. Now imagine that same airplane has one of the strangest reputations in modern aviation, a reputation tied to cold weather. For decades, pilots, passengers, and even some airlines have carried around a simple phrase. The ATR doesn't like the cold. It's a reputation rooted in real events, shaped by tragedy, and kept alive by enthusiasts and professionals who still debate it today. But behind that reputation is a deeper story, one involving multinational cooperation, top-line engineering, and an aircraft family that went on to become the dominator in regional aviation across the globe. Welcome back to A Brief History, a series where I take a look at some of the most influential airplanes and airlines in aviation history. In this episode, I'm taking a look into the ATR-42 and 72 family of aircrafts. In the early 1980s, regional aviation was in a strange place. The demand was there, passengers were traveling more, smaller cities wanted air service, and governments across Europe were beginning to deregulate and open up routes. But the airplanes actually doing that work were aging veterans from the 50s and 60s. You had aircraft like the Fokker F-27 and the Shorts 330. They were loud, heavy on fuel, and not exactly cheap to maintain. Airlines wanted something new, modern, and most importantly, something that could keep costs down on routes where margins were razor thin. At the same time, two manufacturers, Aerospatial in France and Air Italia in Italy, were both studying their own next-generation regional turboprop designs. They each had the same goal a small, lightweight airliner that could carry around 40 passengers, fly short regional hops efficiently, and operate into airports with limited infrastructure. Instead of competing against each other, the two companies realized they would both be stronger by working together. So in 1981, they formed a new joint venture, ATR. It was a rare example of cross-border cooperation in commercial aviation, and from day one, the partnership had a very clear mission build the most efficient regional turboprop the world had ever seen. That set the foundation for what would become the ATR-42. The engineers envisioned an aircraft that didn't need long runways, didn't drink fuel like a jet, and wouldn't hit airlines with crushing maintenance bills. They wanted something simple, rugged, and economical, the kind of airplane that could operate six, seven, even eight short flights a day without breaking the bank. And just as importantly, they wanted to build it at the perfect moment. Fuel prices had spiked, airlines were watching their costs closer than ever, and regional jet technology wasn't mature enough yet to compete on short-haul economics. If ATR could deliver a reliable, efficient turboprop, the market was wide open. And in 1984, they did exactly that. The ATR-42 made its first flight on August 16, 1984, taking off from Toulouse and immediately showing the industry what ATR had been aiming for. It wasn't fast, it wasn't flashy, and it definitely wasn't designed to compete with jets. Instead, it focused on being incredibly efficient, incredibly practical, and perfectly suited for the kind of short regional hops that bigger aircraft simply weren't built to do. The design itself reflected that mission. The ATR-42 used a high-mounted wing, which gave it great lift at low speeds and allowed it to get in and out of shorter runways easier. It was fitted with Pratt & Whitney Canada PW120 series turboprops, known for reliability and fuel economy. And to keep weight down, ATR used composite materials in areas where older turboprops still relied on aluminum. By 1985, the ATR-42 had earned its certification, and France's Air Littoral became the launch customer later that year. Airlines immediately recognized what ATR was trying to do. Here was an aircraft that could carry around 45 to 50 passengers, operate into tiny airports, burn far less fuel than anything else in its class, and run frequent short-haul flights without punishing the airline's bottom line. The early performance numbers were exactly what regional carriers had been hoping for. The ATR-42 was cheaper to operate than most competitors, required less runway, and was simple enough that airlines didn't need massive maintenance operations to keep it flying. 
It became an appealing option not just in Europe, but also in the United States, where regional affiliates like Transworld Express and Texas Air Corporation began adding ATRs to their fleets. And with that early success, it didn't take long for airlines to start asking a predictable question. Could ATR take this same formula and make something a little bigger? Something that could carry more passengers, feed connections into growing airline hubs, and compete directly with larger turboprops like the Dash 8. ATR didn't waste much time responding to the demand for a larger aircraft. By the mid-1980s, regional airlines were starting to grow rapidly, especially in Europe and North America. Hubs were becoming more important, passenger numbers were increasing, and the 40 to 50 seat category the ATR 42 occupied just wasn't enough for many carriers anymore. Airlines wanted something with more capacity, but they didn't want to jump to a jet and take on the higher fuel burn and operating costs. So ATR did what made the most sense. They kept the successful DNA of the ATR-42 and stretched it. The result was the ATR-72, an aircraft that maintained the same basic design philosophy but delivered a significant bump in seating capacity. It was over 4 meters longer, carried up into the low 70s in passengers, and included several refined aerodynamic and structural upgrades to handle the added weight and power. The ATR-72 made its first flight on October 27, 1988, and entered commercial service the following year with Finnair. The timing could not have been better. Regional networks were expanding and turboprops still ruled the short-haul market. Jets were too expensive to operate on 100 to 200 mile routes, and airlines needed an aircraft that could run these shorter flights over and over again. The reaction from airlines was almost immediate. The ATR-72 offered nearly 50% more capacity than the 42 but kept the same cost-saving advantages that made the smaller aircraft a hit. By the time the 1990s rolled around, the ATR-72 was showing up everywhere across Europe, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, and South America. It fed major hubs, connected smaller cities, and operated in environments where jets either struggled or simply weren't profitable. With the ATR-42 and 72 working side by side, the company now had a family of aircraft that covered the majority of regional turboprop demand. But it wasn't just economics and performance that helped the ATR stand out. It was how well the aircraft fit into the realities of regional aviation. Now, I've mentioned a lot about the economics of this plane already, but let's take a deeper look. The biggest advantage was fuel burn. On routes under 300 miles, turboprops already have a natural edge over jets, but the ATR took that advantage even further. The ATR-72, especially in its later versions, consistently burned around 40-45% to 45 less fuel per trip than comparable regional jets. For airlines trying to operate high-frequency regional services, it meant the savings were enormous. Routes that would lose money with a jet suddenly became profitable with the ATR. Then there was runway performance. One of the reasons these aircraft spread so quickly across the areas they did was that they were designed for airports that didn't have long, perfectly paved runways. The ATR can operate from runways as short as 3,500 feet and sometimes even less depending on the conditions. That opened the door to dozens of smaller communities that simply can't support jets and in some cases couldn't even support larger turboprops. For isolated towns, island nations, and rural regions, the ATR wasn't just convenient, it was the only practical option. Maintenance was another major selling point. The ATR kept the systems intentionally simple. The aircraft were easy to service, the parts were relatively inexpensive, and the high-wing design made inspections straightforward. For airlines without massive maintenance operations, this simplicity turned the ATR into an extremely attractive option. And finally, the passenger experience wasn't terrible, especially as later models introduced quieter cabins and updated interiors. Now, sure, turboprops aren't everyone's favorite, but the ATR-72 in particular offered a comfortable enough ride for flights that rarely lasted more than an hour. Put all of that together and you can see why the ATR became the backbone of so many regional fleets around the world. It was affordable, reliable, economical, and flexible, but all of that success would soon be overshadowed by something ATR could never have predicted.
By the early 1990s, the ATR-42 and 72 had firmly established themselves as regional workforces. And that's where ATR's story takes its sharpest turn. If you ask people where the ATR's cold weather reputation really comes from, you'll almost always hear the same answer. The icing incidents of the 90s and one tragedy in particular. On October 31, 1994, American Eagle Flight 4184 was flying from Indianapolis to Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. It was a routine commuter flight carrying 64 passengers and four crew members. As they approached Chicago, air traffic control placed the aircraft in a holding pattern. The weather that day wasn't just cold, it was wet, unstable, and ideal for producing one of the most dangerous icing conditions in aviation, freezing drizzle. Up to this point, icing certification for aircraft was based on a specific set of conditions defined decades earlier known as Appendix C icing. It covered freezing clouds, small droplets, and typical icing environments. What Flight 4184 encountered was worse. It was supercooled large droplets, bigger and heavier what the de-icing system on the ATR-72 had been designed to handle. As the aircraft circled in the hold, ice began to build up not only on the leading edge of the wing, where the de-icing boots were installed, but behind the boots, an area not protected by the system. That's the critical detail. Ice forming aft of the boots changed the wing's aerodynamic profile. A small ridge of ice created turbulent airflow, disrupted lift, and made the wing behave unpredictably. Inside the cockpit, the crew had no reason to suspect anything unusual. They had the boots operating, they were following the procedures of the time, and the instruments weren't showing anything alarming. But as the ridge of ice grew, the margin of safety on the wing shrank rapidly. Then without warning, the aircraft suddenly rolled violently to the right. The crew tried to recover, but the roll exceeded 90 degrees almost instantly. The ATR entered an unrecoverable dive and crashed into a field near Rose Lawn, Indiana, and all 68 people on board were killed. The accident shook the regional airline industry. The ATR had encountered icing conditions outside of the ones it was originally certified for, but the public perception was much simpler. This was an aircraft that didn't handle cold weather well. The idea spread quickly, and suddenly, the ATR had a reputation problem. But to truly understand what happened, you have to separate the headlines from reality. The ATR didn't fail because its de-icing system didn't work, it failed because aviation regulations at the time didn't adequately account for the most extreme icing environments, conditions that went beyond what any turboprop of the era had been tested for. Still, the psychological impact was immediate. Many people, especially in the United States, began to associate the ATR with winter danger. That's where the phrase, the ATR can't fly in the cold, really began. And even though it came from a very specific set of circumstances, the reputation stuck. In the aftermath of the Rose Long crash, the aviation world moved quickly. Regulators, airlines, engineers, and safety investigators all realized the same thing. The ATR hadn't just exposed a vulnerability in its own design, it had revealed a flaw in how the entire industry understood icing. So, the first change after the crash came from regulators. The FAA, EASA, and other authorities issued new airworthiness directives for the ATR family. These directives required updated procedures for when to activate the de-icing boots, limits on flying in certain freezing rain and freezing drizzle conditions, and more specific guidance on holding patterns during winter weather. In other words, pilots now had far clearer rules about when the aircraft could operate safely and when it needed to avoid certain environments altogether. ATR, for their part, didn't wait around. Engineers went back through the aircraft system, focusing on how the wing performed in severe icing. They updated manuals, refined the de-icing cycle, implemented modifications to improve airflow over the wing, and intensified crew training around winter operations. The result wasn't just a safer ATR, it was a safer industry. Aircraft manufacturers around the world had to revisit their assumptions about icing. What happened over Indiana ultimately pushed the entire aviation community to rethink how aircraft behave in the harshest winter weather. Even today, ATR continues to refine the aircraft. New performance packages, cabin upgrades, and optional layouts keep the design competitive. There is even ongoing development around hybrid electric technology and sustainable aviation fuel compatibility, which hints at how the ATR family might adapt for the future. 
If you enjoyed this deep dive, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and check out other episodes of A Brief History for more stories about the aircraft that shaped modern aviation. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.